Hello and welcome to the show. Now I have thoroughly enjoyed driving and building cars to tackle the Needle Pass hill climb stage and because it is such a specialist stage, it's a specialised thing that these cars are running uh, through, we've had some really rather interesting results. The 340R is our current leader and looking like it is mighty tough to try and beat but it's kind of all got me thinking a little bit of some slightly more experimental ideas. So today we are going to do a, you know, the classic built versus bought challenge. We're going to see how high a PI, how faster a car would need to be to beat the Lotus up the mountain completely stock. So we're going to start, I figure this was a sensible place, the Camaro ZL1. We know, very, very good car to drive. However, it is a mid S1 class vehicle. It's got... 48 PI more than you had to play with with any of the vehicles that I built to run up this stage. 650 horsepower, 650 torque. So <laughs> plenty of power, plenty of torque, but it is very heavy in comparison to what we run at 3,800 pounds. Outside the trucks, it's one of the heaviest vehicles that will go up or would have gone up this stage. But, you know, there's a lot more PI going on here. Technically speaking, yes, this is a very quick card. Around a track, it would probably annihilate the A-Class cars, but this is not around a track. This is a very, very specialised sort of thing, and the tyres are not race tyres on this from standard. The cars on the well, equivalent of sports, basically. So it does not quite have the grip of the likes of the 340R. It's not a bad handling car at all. <laughs> it's not a bad handling. We know how fast the ZL1s can be. They are brilliantly quick uh, when it comes to just general circuit driving even and around as I said a normal track it would thrash the A-class cars but on here it does not quite have the great it does have the power we're up to always 98 miles an hour as we head up that crest which is not something the A-class cars were really able to to do it doesn't quite have the grip through the corners there is a bit of sliding there's a bit of oversteer from the vehicle nothing too crazy the Camaro does do a very good job of utilizing its power but you will still have to be a little careful with the throttle out of the slower corners and you simply can't get it turned in as well as the race tired A-class cars that we had been running up here you can see even there for example the front wheels just don't have a grip to get the Camaro turned into the corner now as we come around these final couple of turns it was going quickly certainly now the vehicles with this all had the same three runs that the cars in the build series and I've just taken the fastest one for the sake of this video. So the fastest run that uh, the Camaro would achieve, a 125.1. Now that is a quick time. The Lotus's time that we're trying to beat is a 123.6. Now the Camaro's time would put it into a seventh place here. Uh, while of course it's not following the rules of the series with much higher PI, it uh, beats the 911 Turbo only by two tenths of a second. That's the second fastest of the rear wheel drive cars. It doesn't beat an Evo 6 or the Polaris or the Skyline or the Delta. We're only a tenth faster than the Jaguar F-Pace. So <laughs> it's a quick enough time. You know anything to go 25 up this hill climb course is pretty damn fast but it's nowhere near the Lotus. Up next, I had the, well, I had the theory. All-wheel drive cars had been fast in this series. Far, much faster than I had expected. I thought real drives would stand a decent chance here, but uh, yeah, all-wheel drive cars had been doing very, very well indeed. So, what if we were to go with an all-wheel drive mid S1 class car? The modern NSX, for example, 2 PI higher than the Camaro. Slightly less power, just shy of 600 horsepower, 620 odd torque. It's very similar weight actually between this and the Camaro, both 3,800 pounds. This is a fraction lighter. Of course, you have the benefit of the all-wheel drive traction. To get out of these corners, you can put your foot down out of the corners and the car will be mostly okay. You might get some understeer. At some some all-wheel drive cars, you might get a little bit of oversteer even with it, but on the most part, you can boot it out of the turns and you know, it's going to find it's going to find grip. And on some of these slower corners, even with some of the really, really big, big tired rear wheel drive cars that we'd had with not that much power, even then the all wheel drive was quite, you know, quite advantageous. Now, I found with this car that it just, again, it's another vehicle. It's just lacking grip. You see the understeer we get out of these corners. You just cannot get on the power in the same way. And you can't carry the same speed through these corners that you could with the, the A-Class cars. I'm actually finding this one here was moving about, despite being all-wheel drive, was moving about across the road uh, quite a lot more than a lot of the A-Class cars because it just didn't quite have the grip to, yeah, take take the, take the corners with as much speed. There is a, a flat-out corner for most of, most of the decent A-Class cars has a flat-out corner, and this you've really got to think about what you're doing with the car. Hell, some of the cars are barely even a corner. Again, there's more <laughs> smoke pouring off the tyres. In many ways, more smoke pouring off of this one. More wheel spin in, in some regards than we got from the Camaro as we head up towards the final couple of corners. Similar in terms of pace to the Camaro. Kind of have a, a brief 
checkpoint at that penultimate corner. I have a rough idea what sort of split time I'm looking at. Again, it's not a slow time up the hill climb stage, but it isn't enough. It isn't enough. The NSX, it did struggle getting into some of the corners. You kind of had to chuck the car around a fair bit. So it's another 125. This time a 25.8. It goes into a 13th place. Now, this is a very busy area of the table here. There's less than a second covering all the cars on screen currently. Uh, it's not faster than a Cayenne. It's only a one-tenth of a second faster than a classic NSX. And that was with 50 more PI. You know, the Quattro, another all-wheel drive car, beats the NSX. That's it, 25.8, not a terrible time by any means, by any stretch of the imagination up here, but it's not fast enough. So, sticking with the all-wheel drive theme, it's something a little bit different, a lot smaller, a lot lighter. Less powerful, yes, at only 410 horsepower, but it's only 2,200 pounds. The other thing is, of course, the Metro, the 6R4 here, is on rally tyres to begin with. Its standard tyres are rally tyres, which are better than the sport tyres that we have on the Camaro, we have on the NSX and the cars that we're starting off this video with. So it has got slightly better tyres. They're not as good as race tyres, but it has got slightly better tyres. The Metro is always one of those cars I'm a little bit scared. I say a little bit scared at driving. It can be twitchy, it can be fiddly. Certainly built to certain classes, trying to build one of these to work is rather difficult. From stock, actually not too terrible. It wasn't as bad to drive up here as I feared it might be. Uh, you know, it's it's small, it's light, it's got good acceleration, it changes direction pretty well. If anything, it might be a little soft in the suspension, but we don't see quite the same difficulties getting this car turned in as we did from the NSX. We won't see as much uh, tyre smoke, we won't see as much uh, kind of chucking the car about trying to get any sort of speed out of the vehicle. Although, Again, there is not as much grip as I was expecting with this. We end up out a little bit wide. It's a rally car. I should keep my foot down through all of that. And it's still got the acceleration uh, to make a decent amount of speed up over the crest. We do slightly graze the Armco barrier. Uh, we get away without really losing any time in all of that. Yeah, I mean, it moves around quite a lot. This vehicle, you see it moving around on the suspension. It felt pretty quick going up here. And again, it's the hope that that all-wheel drive traction was going to be enough really. The hope that you can make the most of the power, make the most of the acceleration in places and certainly as we come up towards this uh, penultimate corner. Again, it was another car. It was going quickly and we can get around these final hairpins, sort of the last uh, blast to the finish line. We don't have to worry about the oversteer that we see some from some of the rear-wheel drive cars. You can just boot it and go. We know the Metro is going to be fast accelerating indeed as we head across the line. It was quick. It was quick. Now we're getting up to well, 852. It's only 4 PI higher than the Camaro. But we're down to a 24. 124.5 for the Metro, which would be a third place. It fractionally beats the Lancia Delta and the Skyline. Again, we're 50 PI higher. It doesn't beat the Quartz Regalia. It's a second still away from the 340R. The, the, the Regalia was one of those weird outliers that really shouldn't have gone as fast as it did. The Metro is, is quick. There is no doubt about it. The Metro is very quick when it comes to running up this course. However, it's not fast enough to challenge the Lotus. So, we move a little higher in terms of PI. 866 for the ACR Viper, so 66 PI over the likes of the Lotus. And again, this is another vehicle we know is a damn good handling car. We know the ACR Viper is a fantastic handling car. 600 horsepower, 560 torque going on in this. No, not quite as much as the Camaro. It is lighter, a bit lighter than the Camaro, 3,400 pounds. Still considerably heavier than just about everything we'd built into A-Class. The hope here is that the combination of the power and the grip that we're going to get from the cars. Yeah, the vehicles that we're using here, of course, from stock haven't got any Forza Aero parts available. You know, I'm not able to add any downforce. This thing from standard, you know, it's got big, big levels of aero going on with it. Yeah, the Forza Aero parts might add a bit, but from, from stock, this has got a lot of downforce going on. Uh, perhaps one of the slight downsides of the ACR... So it does have quite it has some quite long gears, trying to find the right gear to be. If you kind of go into first down there, you do tend to just spin the wheels up when you leave it. And there's enough power and torque, you can kind of get away with second. Again, it's another vehicle that is certainly a nice car to drive. We all know the ACR Viper is a, is a nice car to drive. However, around this sort of course, there are still places where you are losing time, when you are losing speed. It's another, it's almost 99 miles an hour. Couldn't quite crack the 100 before the, <laughs> the crest there. Uh, but it does, you can just feel the lack of grip compared, not just to the Lotus, but compared to a bunch of the A-Class cars that have run up here. You've just got to be a little slower. Now, it makes up some of that time with sheer acceleration. 
when you've got this much power, when we're starting to get up towards the higher levels of S1 class, yeah, the cars accelerate like crazy compared to their A-class counterparts. The sacrifices you made with the A-class cars, you know, you always go handling. You always, always go handling for this, which meant, you know, they lo lost a little bit of power. Uh, they, you know, were never going to be as fast accelerating around around some of these slightly longer straights. We leave the final core, actually a big oversteer moment for the Viper as we head across the line. It's into the 23s with the Viper. It does get down to a 123.9. Which is, again, mighty, mighty vast. We're getting closer. Still, it still doesn't beat the Quartz. It's three-tenths of a second away from the Lotus. It does a good showing for the Viper to go ahead of the Metro 6R4. That is, you know, it is a decent, a decent time. And it is a fair bit faster than the Camaro. I think that's the downforce and so on. I mean, that's a tra full-on track-based uh, <laughs> track Viper that we have going on up the course. So... Yeah, serious, serious piece of machine. We go to McLaren next for a 650S Spider. Now, PI-wise, we're back up to... Well, we keep going up. We're up 873 now with the car. 650 horsepower, 500 torque, 3,200 pounds in this one. So, power is not lacking for power. It's not lacking for power in the slightest. Okay, it's not quite as mad track-orientated as the Viper. But, you know, this you're expecting this to be pretty damn fast. I'll, I'll be honest, I picked the Spider purely because I had one in my garage. The Coupe might be a fraction faster, but uh, yeah, I had one in my garage, so that is why we are using this. Unfortunately for the McLaren, oversteer. Oversteer, well I say oversteer would be a problem, it's the lack of traction. With the Viper, with the Metro, you could put your foot down out of the corners and it would go. You do that in the McLaren and you just get wheel spin. You've got to be very, very careful with the car on this on this stage, it just wants to spin the rear wheels, it wants to slither around a bit, and that costs you heaps of time around here. Either you have to do what I'm doing here, which is drive perhaps a little bit more course, you've got to wait that bit longer to get on the throttle, or if you do put your foot down, you're just going to waste time going sideways. And you waste more time going sideways than you do if you're just a little bit careful. So, yeah, you've got to be really, really careful. And this, having gone from a Viper to driving this, uh, this felt nowhere near as good. It was quite struggling with... I say with, with understeer, it just couldn't it couldn't get turned into the corners, and then I couldn't get on the throttle well enough out of the turns to make the most of any power because it's going to be very fast accelerating. It's going to be way faster than the A-class cars. You know, it's 73 pi higher than the likes of the Lotus and the Deltas and all of those kind of vehicles. It's got the acceleration, but you just can't use it because it doesn't really have the grip to make it work around here as we round the final corner. It was not looking good. The 340R is already finished by this point as the McLaren comes across the line. Yeah, that was the fastest run I could get out of the car. It was really struggling up this course. A 126.9 from the 650S. That puts it down in 33rd place. It's only a tenth of a second faster than a Renault Clio RS. That's a front-wheel drive. And let's not forget Renault Clio. It's only a tenth faster than a limo that was also front-wheel drive. It's beaten by a Javelin, the Warthog, the Atomic Punk, the Golf. It, yeah, the McLaren really did not enjoy that course. The McLaren was not a fan in the slightest of, uh, of that particular course. We go, well, even higher in terms of the PI883 now. We're talking about for the Ferrari 488 GTB. You know, modern Ferrari, 660 horsepower, 560 torque, 3,200 pounds. Fairly, I say fairly similar stats along the lines of the 650 that we just run up the course. And, well, it would be along the lines, sort of similar lines in terms of handling, in terms of the issues the car was going to come across. Once more, we lack the grip to really make the most of the car's speed. It might be very, I'd say, again, much like all the previous cars. Yes, this would annihilate the A-Class cars around a circuit with any length of straight, any length of acceleration zones. Maybe that tiny, fiddly, Ambleside village circuit would be a different story because that's much more along the lines of this particular hill climb stage. But again, the, the Ferrari it cannot get turned in well enough to these corners. It can't get turned in in the same way that we saw the likes of the Viper. For example, get the get the front end turned in, and it doesn't quite have the traction. You see the understeer that we have there. That's you know it's, it's still a very fast car, of course, but this is not carrying any more speed into these corners that we saw from the A-class cars. It can't do it now. It's mighty quick up here. It's 106 miles an hour before we jump on the brakes, and the brakes are good. It'll get it stopped for the next part of the corner. But I can't use that acceleration most places. 
I've got to have a huge lift. Again, remember, that corner, flat out, not even a corner you think about. In a lot of the A-Class cars and in the Ferrari, it's a big slowdown through there. Yes, quick out the other side again. But it was, it was another vehicle really, really struggling getting the front end to work up this course. And as we head towards the penultimate hairpin, it's not looking great in terms of the time. Much so Stat-wise, much more comparable to the 650S. I mean, I guess car perhaps more comparable to the 650S as we round the final corner. It's still struggling to get any grip. And as we head towards the line, it is a fraction faster than the McLaren. But we are still down in the 26s. 126.223 for the vehicle which puts it into 22nd. It is uh, beaten by an M1, uh, Renault 5, Lotus Exige. It does beat the Lotus Esprit, it beats the MX-5. It does beat the front-wheel drive cars, the Civic RS being the fastest of the front-wheel drive cars, but it's only two-tenths of a second quicker than that. It's only two-tenths of a second quicker than a Mercury Coupe up <laughs> the course. So, 488 GTB, that was not, not really working either. Again, bear in mind, PI-wise, we are now getting quite high in terms of the PI stakes. It's uh, 888 as we go to the McLaren F1 GT. 618 horsepower in this. Not quite as much torque, just shy of 500, but it is light at uh, 2,500 pounds. And hell, this is a well, road-going version of a full-on race car. So, you know, it's a pretty damn special car. It's a pretty damn special car, uh, this particular vehicle. Now, aero-wise... It is admittedly more, I think, more of a straight line speed car, unlike the Viper that has huge levels of downforce. This will have some, and perhaps more than uh, some of the other cars that have gone, but it is, again, a little bit more uh, designed for the, for the straight line speed stuff. And, well, the understeer was chronic in this car. We saw with the 650S and the 488 a little bit, sort of struggling for rear end grip, struggling for traction and so on. Not so much of an issue with the McLaren. I could not get the front end to turn in full stop. It just didn't want to go. The gear's perhaps not helping this car particularly very, very long uh, first gear. Although even most of the time, again, the acceleration was not the real concern. The acceleration was not the bit that was slow about this car. It was the fact that I just couldn't carry the speed through all of here. Although as we do <laughs> a big slide on the exit there, it's another car, phenomenal speed once it gets going. It's 106 miles an hour, which is one of the fastest we've ever seen, pretty much, uh, tackling that particular section. But again, I've got to really slow down through there because I just can't, I don't get away, I don't try getting away with much more speed than that. It's just going to understeer off the course. Again, we're struggling to get the car turned in as it runs a little bit wide. We'll get away with bobbling across the uh, slight gravel on the inside up towards the the final couple of corners and again you look at the time and it's it's around where <laughs> the 488 is around where the 650s was uh, in terms of in terms of stage time it's not going to be beating the 340r it's not even going to be remotely close as we round the final head in the 340r's across the line and the mclaren will accelerate quickly towards it but it, it, strug it struggled a lot more than i expected it to that mclaren really struggled an awful lot more it was a 126.8 which <laughs> you know that's um yeah, quite, quite, quite. It beats the 650S, but again, we're doing it's quite a long way down in all of this. Uh, it's slower than the front wheel drive Golf. Up here, we're talking two tenths slower than the front wheel drive Golf, a couple of tenths faster than the Clio, gets, but still get beaten by the Warthog, the Atomic Punk, and an AMC Javelin. Too much understood. Neither of the McLarens really enjoyed their time up the hill climb stage. But both the McLarens were really, really rather struggling with this. We were starting to have to get a bit creative. I say a bit creative. We're up to S2 class now. You see that 922 PI? This is 122 PI above the 340R. Um, I know I'm using the Veyron Supersport because once you start getting to S1 class, a lot of the vehicle, or S2 class, sorry, stock, a lot of the cars are coming on race tyres. This is one of the highest PI cars I could find that was still using the Sport tyres. And I wanted to see, could this, would this be able to beat the 340R uh, still being on the Sport tyres? I mean, we're talking... Near enough, 1,200 horsepower, 1,100 torque. Yes, it's heavy at 4,000 pounds, but it is all-wheel drive. Surely this much brute power would be enough to beat the 340R. Handling is, well, in typical Veyron fashion, uh, not great. It's big, it's heavy, it doesn't really get turned, and there's so much fury wanting to be unleashed whenever it gets to a corner exit that it is... You've got to be careful with this car. You've got to be mindful. Of course, yes, it helps that the vehicle is on... Uh, is, is all-wheel drive. You know, you, you can get away with a bit more because the car is all-wheel drive, but 
you've still got that massive understeer. We saw the massive understeer going on. We can't really carry the same speed on the way into this corner that we have with some vehicles, but you're making your time up here. This is where you're hoping to make the time up to an extent. It's not actually as fast as the McLaren because I, have, I know I have to get on the brakes early uh, through there. Uh, it would be quicker than the McLaren, of course if I break to the same point, but then we'd never stop it. So you've got to try and kind of balance that. However, this section here, for example, is 116 miles an hour. Nothing else gets even close to that around <laughs> around this hill climb stage. Or even the smallest of straights, if you've got the car set up and, and, you know, ready to go, you can get a lot of speed out of this. And the all-wheel drive means that you can boot it out of these hairpins with relative safety. It's still a little bit of moving around as we head up towards the final corner. It's not actually looking amazingly fast at the at sort of at the split, but it's this sort of drive out of the hairpins that is so very powerful. And yes, the S2 class of Aveyron can beat the 340R, but it's just. I mean, we're talking it's only just. I say it's only just. Uh, it's a 22.7, which is uh, just under a second faster than the 340R. That's S2 class. We've needed to go that sort of speed. We've had to go to S2 class to be able to beat the 340R by nine-tenths of a second. We consider the 340R beats the Metro by a similar margin. Yeah, that Lotus is bloody fast. And, you know, the Quattro Gaglia is up there as, as well. Now, as I mentioned, of course, we were testing cars there that were running on the sport tyres. There are a few cars that will be running on race tyres at lower PIs. Now, these are, I'd say these are a little bit more difficult to find. Um, there isn't so many to pick from when it comes to S1 class. Most of these are reserved, naturally, for the S2 class, for the monsters. However, the KTM Crossbow GT4 is one such vehicle that you can do. Now, PI-wise, we are talking about 861 PI, so we're still 60 PI higher than the 340R. Power-wise, 326 uh, torque is just under 300. It is about a thousand pounds heavier than the 340R at 2,352 pounds, but this is a GT4 car. You know, this is a crazy, crazy race car uh, that I would have been very, very surprised if this hadn't gone faster than the 340R. It's in many ways it's probably one of the far one of the fastest S1 class cars if you're wanting something uh, for technical circuits because well. Funnily enough, there's a lot of grip, and having driven a lot of understeery machines that had no real rear-end grip, this was quite pleasant. This this was quite pleasant to go and have a drive with. Uh, it was one of those vehicles that it was easy to take too little speed into a corner because you just don't realise how capable the car is. I'm so used to driving other vehicles. In, in this filming, I was so used to driving, you know, the understeery cars that were all basically brute forcing their way up this, this course. So you suddenly go to this that can carry huge amounts of corner speed and it does have you know better top end acceleration than the 340R. The, the Lotus had about 200 horsepower. Uh, yes it was very light power to weight ratio was good but once you get past a certain speed you just start running out of power and the K uh, KTM sorry doesn't quite have those sort of issues as we round the final couple of corners it was going as expected very fast and it's just the speed that we can take through these corners even if it's a little wide out of the final turn as we run towards the finish line it's comfortably comfortably faster than the 340R. So yes, mid S1 class, if the vehicle, if, if the stock of vehicle comes with race tyres, that is going to go a touch faster. Now I, when I was initially flicking through, didn't realise that the more modern of the ACR Viper, is this the 2016 ACR Viper? Didn't realise that this actually started off on race tyres. I was looking through, you know, looking through the PIs, we'd seen that, I'd seen that the McLaren had already really really struggled so i was looking across and this is slightly higher pi than the mclaren we're talking 893 in terms of pi we've already seen the initial initial viper go very quickly me thinking this was on sport tires would go and give this a try thinking oh well this might be close to uh, beating the 340r of course it isn't on sport tires so not only do we have 645 horsepower 600 torque uh, relative i say relatively like in comparison to the cars that have gone today excluding the KTM, 3,300 pounds, is relatively light. Um, and yeah, a lot of grip. You've got a lot of downforce, of course. Again, another full-on track spec vehicle, track designed vehicle, which means the standard downforce is pretty damn high. And yes, this has race tyres, which makes it, it makes it, well, very, very good to drive, as you could imagine up here. We can carry speed through these corners, and then we have the sheer power once you get out of the corners to really make most of it. None, none of these cars were really able to be flat through that section. 
Uh, however, the <laughs> it's up to 105 before the crest. We can jump on the brakes and then we can carry more speed through here. It doesn't really suffer from very much in the way of wheel spin either. This corner, they've thrown so many of these supercars uh, into trouble. Absolutely no issue for the Viper. And yeah, we were seeing no real wheel spin concerns for the car as we leave another, you know, slow speed tight hairpin. There's a teeny little bit uh, through there. There's a teeny bit of uh, wheel spin in a couple of places. It's not enough to ever really give the car a problem. And again, there's enough power, enough torque. We'll get away with second. There's no real need. First, it's always, it's always a bit of a risk. It wouldn't quite work. It's just a little too, a little too fast for first gear. As we leave the final corner, run towards the line, it's miles faster. If you get the race tyres on the cars in, in S1 class, they will Funnily enough, beat it. Uh, that's down to a 120.3. So, phenomenal time from the Viper. Uh, does, you know, comfortably beat the uh, crossbow as well. It's, what, three and a bit seconds faster than the Lotus. Those were kind of a little bit more experimental things. But, yeah. I was really, I say I was really surprised. I guess I kind of was, I kind of wasn't. This, this hill climb stage is very specialised, naturally. You know, you're going to need very specialised vehicles to run quickly up this is why the 340R is working and weirdly why the quartz regalia uh, was working but when you're talking about a car on sports tires trying to beat uh, specialized vehicles you are having to go up to s2 class you're having to go all the way up to some of the fastest cars in the world uh, to try and brute force your way past the 340R that is yeah Quite, I, I was really expecting sort of the higher S1 class cars, the likes of the 650S, the 488, to be able to do it. They just can't, they really can't, they really struggled as well. Uh, so, <laughs> there you have it. There you have it, you need an awful lot of PI on uh, on on the sports tyres, beat the 340R. With the race tyres, you can do it with less, although not that many cars, uh, stock cars, will come with the race tyres. There we go. Fun, fun little interesting experiments. Turns out the Veyron's not all that much better than an A-Class 340R. That is going to be it for this video, though. Thank you all very much for watching, and until next time, a goodbye.